My wife and I have a black cat named Shade. And our home is pretty dark even during the day, especially in the hallway. Two days ago, I was about to leave the bathroom, opened the door and turned the light off. I glanced down and saw my dog standing there looking at me. And I saw movement in front of her on the floor and saw what looked like my cat walking through the dark hallway towards her. There were a few little spots of light and I saw him in those, clearly. I turned to get my phone from the counter and left the bathroom, went to the end of the hall to my bedroom and opened the door. My cat was laying on the bed next to my wife. My wife and I sleep during the day as we work at night and yesterday I was headed to bed. My wife was already laying in bed and the be bedroom light was off. The room was barely lit up by the sun outside, barely coming in through our black curtains. When I went into my, the room, my wife asked if Shade was in the bedroom and I said I didn't know. She called for him and then said, there he is, and pointed to the hall just outside of our open bedroom door. The hall was dark, of course, and I couldn't see his little black ass, so I said, where? She said, right there, sitting in the hall, just on the other side of the door. I kept looking and straining to see in the dark, but couldn't see anything. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw him walking in front of our bed. I said, he's right there. She said, I still see him in the hall. I turned on my phone's flashlight and shined it in the doorway and nothing was there. We've really got to get out of this place. September 2020, I was taking my wife to work as I did almost every night of the week. On the way, we drove through this little country town of Rayleigh near Oxford, Ohio. On the road, we were on there's a big hill going down into the town. We had been that way a ton of time, so we knew all of the little landmarks, trees, road signs, mailboxes, etc. Right behind the big green sign that said we were in Rayleigh, there was a man standing there on the side of the road looking our way. Because he was something out of the ordinary, I quickly looked over and got a good look at him for the brief second I had before we passed by. At that same time, my wife saw him and she said before I could, Ong, did you see that? I asked her what she saw and she told me exactly what I saw. He was a civil war soldier and he was not a person in costume. She said she saw a detailed face, but I didn't. For starters, he was mostly white and glowing, like my headlights were really lighting him up but they weren't shining directly on him and he was bright. I was drawn to his face because of what I saw. It was just a blank white glowing area. He had his right leg up on the slight hill on the road and had his rifle in his hand, holding it to the ground like a cane. He had a kepi hat on and it seemed like he wasn't just white, but shades of light gray, though glowing white. And that was it. We purposefully drove that way every night after until she lost her job because of the pandemic, just hoping to see him again, but we never did. I have wanted to stop by at the house near where he was to ask them if they had ever seen him or if maybe they had a costume from the Civil War and they were just hanging out freaking people out. Though I'm not sure how they would have pulled off the glowing and faceless appearance, but I haven't yet and probably never will. Oh yeah, the other, the other cemetery in Rayleigh is where one guy who is not known for telling any tales let alone tall ones, told my dad once that he drove by and saw a werewolf there. The whole area is creepy. My oldest could talk before she could walk. As a toddler, she always got excited when we invited people over for a party. One particular July 4th family gathering, when her godfather made his usual appearance, she was so excited to see him that she ran to him yelling, Uncle Tony, Uncle Tony. Her loud screeches of delight caught my attention, but I wondered who she was yelling for. I saw my brother-in-law scoop her up in his arms. I saw the whole exchange. But who was Uncle Tony? When I caught my husband's attention, I asked, Who's Uncle Tony? He answered in a flat tone, Chucky. I must have had quite a confused look on my face, because he quickly explained that his brother, who we always called Chucky, Rachel's uncle who was holding her now, had a name the family never used. His name was Anthony, he said, 
He was named after my father. He's the only one who called him Tony. Now at this point, I had known my brother-in-law for more than 10 years. I even worked with him a couple of years in the same office. And I never once heard Chucky called Anthony or Tony for that matter. I walked over to Rachel and Chucky and asked if he had told her his real name. He answered no, why would I? To this day, she still calls him Uncle Tony. She's the only one in the family that does. Her grandfather told her this well-kept family secret. After all, he was the one who had given his first son his name. But there was only one problem with the idea. Grandad had been dead for over 40 years. This happened about five years ago while I was still at high school. My family lived about 15 kilometers out of town on a dairy farm in rural New Zealand. My sisters and I had to catch a bus every morning to get to school. On this particular morning, there was a strange light mist over the entire la landscape, but it was early in the morning and the mist seemed to be clearing. Me and my sisters had an uneasy feeling and the air was uncomfortably still. About 10 minutes into standing on the roadside waiting for the school bus, I noticed a weird figure about 300 meters away between two very tall hedges. It was very tall and thin and was black all over with no visible features besides arms, legs and a head. The hedges it was standing between are around 5 meters tall and the creature was about half as tall which is insane. I told my sisters and they both looked but only one of them could see it. After about five minutes of watching the creature, my sister turned away and at that moment, the thing leapt off the road and into the hedge. Not long after that, the bus came, but the whole experience spooked me and my sister for a long time. Anyone have any ideas what this could be? I was probably eight or nine at the time of the first dream. It was short, but at the time was the worst nightmare I'd ever had. It started with me walking down the narrow hallway of our house towards the bathroom. To set the scene, the walls had a dark wood panelling about halfway up and light wallpaper the rest of the way. The hallway was short and in kind of an L shape with the bathroom straight ahead at the end and my sister's room to the left of the bathroom door. It must have been set in the late evening as the lighting in the hallway and bathroom was dim natural light. I walked down the hallway and into the bathroom, turning to the left and starting to wash my hands in the sink. I then looked up at myself in the mirror and noticed something behind me. I turned around and there was a young girl about the same height as me at the time. She had pale, almost grey skin in the dim light and was wearing a blue dress with white lacy bits on the front. She also had blonde hair, but the creepiest parts were her eyes. I immediately was drawn into her eyes, which seemed too big for her face. They were a crazy deep blue color, but she had no pupils, and the blue of her iris took up her entire eye. They were so endlessly deep that I couldn't look away. Then I woke up, panting in a cold sweat. The whole dream only lasted about 30 seconds, but the memory has been burned into my mind. Since then, the girl has appeared in my dreams multiple times, often in reflections or hiding behind things, but never again a close encounter. My dreams also always seem to end not long after she appears. The house itself was creepy and there were a few strange occurrences that could be connected, though I doubt it. Namely one night, I heard a small whimpery scream really late at night. My sister's room joined onto mine through a short door that we kept locked most of the time, so I assumed it was just one of them. However, the next morning at breakfast, they asked me if I had screamed in the night because it woke all three of them up. A dear friend of mine invited my family and me to her wedding in a small little town pretty far from the city. Although I felt laziness about going, it's almost a four hour drive. I knew we were just a few guests and I couldn't pass. I also thought that the wonderful landscape and amazing weather for the swimming pool would make it worth it. My partner and daughters didn't know this part of the country 
and I wanted to show them an amazing waterfall and an old castle on the way. The castle had become a hotel for years, but I didn't know if it was still working. Anyway, we prepared our luggage, great music, and left. The trip was long, and despite the beautiful landscape, we were all getting tired. Night fell, and I felt quite disappointed since we wouldn't be able to see the waterfalls. In fact, there was soon nothing left to see but the road in front of us. After a while, I recognized some places, a little town, a bridge. I knew we were getting near the castle and wanted to show them. Finally, after a closed curve of the road, I saw it. All the lights were on and the castle sparked to our left for the moments we had it on sight. My partner asked where it was, but I was afraid he might just take the eyes off the poorly lit road, so I told him to go on. My youngest daughter said, great, it's open. Can we stop for a while when we're coming back? Because right now, it would freak me out. Of course, I said yes. The castle had many legends of hauntings and paranormal activities, and my younger kid didn't like the idea of going at night since she had many different experiences and didn't want anything weird to get stuck with us in her own words. The oldest kept quiet, but since she is on these awful teenage years and she was tired, I didn't pay much attention to it. The lights had disappeared behind the trees, but I was sure there was a party or something going on, and it meant they kept on receiving guests and we could enjoy something nice at their restaurant on our way back. We finally arrived to our destination, a hotel of a small town, just occupied by the wedding party. Two days there and it was time to come back. We left early since the kids had school the next day, and we preferred enjoying the sight of the landscape and not just the night. I asked my partner to stop by the castle and so he did when we were close to it. We went there enthusiastic, but the more we approached, the more we could notice it had been unoccupied for a while. Some walls were falling, dusty construction material was on the edge of the castle. It was probably being repaired, but some way, shortness of money or any other reason, had made them stop for a while. It was empty. There was no one, nor nothing there, but the old walls. Electricity didn't work, and plants had invaded the empty swimming pool. My little one and myself were stunned, but there was plenty of light in the windows two days ago. My older daughter finally said, I thought you were joking, I didn't see a thing. The layers of dust on the floors were proof that nobody had been around for a while. Still, my youngest and I know what we've seen. Lights in every window. My mum and I went to take dinner to my dad at work, and during that time my brother and his then girlfriend had moved back in with us. Anyways, my mum and I had just gotten home, so we went through the garage. When you walked into the garage, you would walk into the dining room, and to the left of that was the kitchen and living room. On the kitchen counter, we had an aquarium with turtles, the kind you can buy at the pet store or swap meet. Anyways, we get home, and my mum and I walk into the living room, and she sits down, she asks, who's that girl? I didn't see anyone when we walked in, so I asked, what girl? And she said, the blonde girl that was playing with the turtles. Again, there was no one there. My brother and his girlfriend were in their room, so I guess my mom thought that there was a friend of theirs. I told my mom that there was no one there. She looked horrified and insisted that she saw a blonde girl looking at the aquarium with the turtles. She turned and smiled at my mom. My mom assumed it was my brother or his girlfriend's friend. But there was no one there. At that point, I laughed and asked my mom, so you still don't believe me when I tell you this house is haunted? She looked shocked and scared and made me go double check, and there still wasn't anyone there. The next day, she asked my brother if they had company, and he said no. She finally started to believe after several years. Hi, I have a story from a couple years back, maybe 2016. I was younger then, so I don't remember too well. I'm 13 now. So some information before the story. My house is a very small, it's a three bedroom, one and a half bath. We have a carpet door which leads into the kitchen. 
The front door which leads into our dog room and a back door that leads into the living room. The living room has a hallway where on the right is my room and my brother's room. On the left is my parents' room and the full bathroom. The half bath is in my parents' room. We have a camera in the kitchen dining room that can see the hallway and living room fully. And our house was built around 1902. So one day, my mom was browsing the camera on her phone. I don't remember why. But as she was looking, she saw this orb that was in the dining room, like at the edge of the table, and it followed my mom into her room. It was a tiny white orb. She was shocked and called me and my brother so we could see. My brother is three years younger than me. I saw it and was pretty scared. Even though I have never had any ghosts in our house, we have never harmed or intentionally scared us. They are pretty peaceful. The second last story is when one day I stayed up later than usual. It was around 1 a.m. I enjoy sleeping a lot, so it was unusual for me to be up around that time. But I felt very paranoid and had pretty bad chills, and I could just feel the tension in my body, almost like I knew there was an entity in my house at the moment. And that feeling was there for at least 20 minutes prior to it happening. All of a sudden, I hear a cup fall out of the cabinet in the kitchen. The cabinets don't open easily, so no air could have opened it and make a cup fall. Also, we don't open windows in our house, like there's no reason behind it. But we just don't like to have windows open, so there was no wind. Now with some bad news. While the past couple of days were pretty silent, last night was terrible. I had that unsettling feeling for most of the night before we went to bed, so I knew something was gonna happen. When we were in bed before we went to sleep, my girlfriend joked around that she was possessed by a demon and kept making this really creepy grin. Like one where you're smiling ear to ear but your eyes are wide open. I could tell she was joking, but still a little creepy. After that, she told me the ghost in her dream said I was cheating on her. I definitely am not. We've been dating three years and I would never do that to her. So apparently this ghost is a home wrecker. While that's not necessarily creepy, just annoying that a ghost is trying to break us up. Things picked up when she went to sleep. It started with this loud booming sound, sort of like a big truck driving by your window with the rhythmic beat of the engine. At first, that's what I thought it was. The window in our bedroom is right over a street where it's not rare for a big truck to drive by, but this booming never stopped. There wasn't a single point where this noise was coming from. No matter where I looked, the volume of the boom never changed. Throughout the entire night, it never stopped, never got louder, never changed the rhythm, just kept beating. Normally, I would easily be able to write this off and just fall asleep. But about 30 minutes after my girlfriend fell asleep, she started talking again. At first, she looked like she was having a pleasant conversation. She held out her hand for what looked like a handshake and started giggling. After that, I could hear her bring up my name in the incoherence of her sleep talk, so I thought, maybe she's talking to me in her dream. Nope. After a little more of the conversation went on, she looked at me with her eyes open and said, we're talking about you and started giggling, then passed right back out. This creeped me out a lot, reminding me of the first night at the lake house. After such a spook, there was only one thing I could do, fall deep into a YouTube rabbit hole. I put my AirPods in, I could still hear the booming, but a little more muffled, and pulled up a video. About another half hour goes by and my girlfriend is talking again. This conversation seems a little more serious, as she's not giggling and her tone had changed. After about a minute of talking, she sits up in bed and does just about the worst thing I could imagine. She crawls over to my side of the bed, crouches down on the floor, points under the bed, looks directly into my eyes and says, there's men moving around under there. She just got back into bed and fell asleep like nothing happened. About an inch away from needing to change my pajama pants, I shake her awake and say, what did you mean by that? She looked really confused and told and said she had no clue what I was talking about. I said, please tell me you're joking. You don't remember a thing. You just pointed under the bed and said there are men moving under there. 
She immediately looks horrified and says, I have no clue what you're talking about. Quit scaring me. It took a bit longer for her to fall asleep after that, and I turned my phone flashlight on for the remainder of the night. Not much happened after that. There was another point where she held her hand out for a handshake and mumbled something, but no conversation that time. She left at about 7.30 this morning, but after saying goodbye, I immediately got back into bed and passed out. When I woke up again around 10.30, I felt this completely overwhelming sadness that had me on the verge of tears. Even in that moment when you first wake up and you can't remember a single thing about your day, I still felt that sadness. Of course, I love and miss my girlfriend with all of my heart, but she was only going to be gone a couple of days, and even when we would take separate trips, neither of us get this world-ending feeling. It genuinely felt like the world had gone grey and the only thing I could do was cry. Luckily, I was able to push through this feeling, give my pets breakfast and take my dog out to potty. Not even 30 seconds of being outside and the feeling was completely gone. Again, I miss my girlfriend a lot and still feel that, but not to the point of mental breakdown. It seems like activity is picking up again and the men moving under the bed definitely seem to miss my girlfriend too. Seeing as they are already trying to break us up and now I'm alone at the apartment with them, I'm pretty terrified. I might go get some sage to smudge the apartment later today. After some research and talking to some helpful, I've come to the conclusion that I'm going to fight it. I've been a skeptic my entire life and thought 99% of hauntings have some sort of rational explanation. There may be for what I'm going through as well. But if the truth is really this far out, I don't see why a solution couldn't be as equally far out. My plan is to go all Doctor Strange on it. I'm going to meditate until I can visualize whatever it is and use some lucid dream style superpowers to kick it out. Again, I never believed in anything like this before, but if this does happen to be real, then I don't see why going spirit world Kung Fu Panda can't work. Even if nothing happens, that just means it's probably a lack of sleep among other rational explanations. And if it does, then it means I've killed a demon using psychic powers. So like, that's not really a downside. My girlfriend went to visit her family, but I stayed behind to work because we're broke college students. For some reason, every time my girlfriend leaves the apartment, the activity picks up to a whole new level. It started once the sun started to set, an uneasy feeling that I wasn't alone. Slight things kept happening before the sun completely set, like the occasional knock on the wall or a cold spot, which was weird because my AC is broken and the temperature was 76 Fahrenheit or 25 Celsius in my apartment. I was sitting on my couch, which is positioned right next to the door to my balcony. The bottom of the door has this layering underneath to protect from heavy rain getting under the door. And it makes a pretty loud scraping sound whenever the door moves. Every five minutes or so, I would hear the door get tugged or pushed in its frame. At this point, I already know what's coming once it gets dark out, so I mentally prepare for the night ahead. Just as expected, activity increased dramatically as soon as the sun set. The first sign was the poking. The cold spots were getting more and more frequent, and some were accompanied by tugs on my shirt, poking my legs or chest, and the occasional brushing on my arm. I was too tired to really do much about it, so I just chilled out through this, until my cat, who was previously napping in the bedroom, came into the living room. As soon as she walked out, she looked straight into the corner of the room next to the couch and got immediately into defense mode. All the hairs on her back stood up and she started growling or hissing at what seemed to be the air. Now my cat is sweet as can be. And the only time she ever meows or growls is when my dog is chasing her around the apartment and she feels threatened. I've never seen her go on the attack before but she usually just turns tail and hides whenever she feels threatened. That's why when she full sprint charged at the corner and started trying to claw through the wall, I was a bit surprised. Just a couple seconds later, I heard what can only be described as a cat screaming and she bolted back into the bedroom to hide. She did this a few times, coming out, growling, charging at the wall and running away screaming before she came up with a new strategy. Throughout this, 
I think she just noticed I was just chilling and eventually gave up on the attack. She laid down on a chair that was towards the middle of the room and started tracking it. I have a couple of videos of her tracking this thing that I'll post on my profile. Whatever it was could move fast and it wasn't limited to the ground. At this point, I was seeing little orbs of light or flashes flying around the room. Most happened in the corner of my eyes, but I saw a few head on. All the orbs of light were very small and would move a short distance before disappearing. Now, it was about 1am at this point, so it could be from the potential hallucinations due to being tired, but the previous few nights I got 7 hours of sleep or more, so I wasn't super sleep deprived or anything. After a particularly loud bang on the wall near my head, I decided enough was enough and I had to leave for a bit. Previously I told it to leave, but I never saw orbs of light or bangs this loud and definitely didn't want to piss it off. I took a quick midnight Taco Bell trip to wash my fears away with a Baja Blast, giving me time to calm myself down before going back in. Walking back into the room felt like the meme from Community where Troy brings the pizza into the burning apartment. My cat sprints over to me in the door and immediately goes to attack the thing. Apparently it was under the table next to the couch, while I saw three orbs fly through the air within just a few seconds of me walking back in. Seeing as whatever it was was just playing with my cat and hadn't hurt me so far, I just walked back to the couch with my Taco Bell and started playing some games on my laptop as a distraction. After a couple more minutes, I remembered I wanted proof. This was when I decided to start filming. My cat had retreated back to her chair and was just tracking this thing everywhere. As you'll see in the video, it appears that there are a few times it runs right over to me. Almost every time that happened, I would instantly feel colder. About 10 minutes after the last video was taken, I became incredibly tired out of the blue. I could barely keep my eyes open and almost fell asleep on the couch a few times before I decided it would be best to go to my room, away from whatever this was. As soon as I sat up to get off the couch, there was a huge bang on the glass table next to me. I was too tired to care at all, and I knew this spooky fellow was all bark, so I went to my room anyway. My cat followed quickly and acted as my personal bodyguard. She sat on my chest and would start pawing at the air whatever it got was too close. After a short while, I somehow fell asleep. It's now the next morning and my girlfriend is debating on staying at her family's house a little longer as her best childhood friend is visiting their hometown in a couple of days as well. If that's just night one, then I'm not sure I'm ready for what else is to come. I know this sounds like a cliche monster under the bed, but hear me out. This has been happening since like four years we moved to this house. The thing is, I usually see with my legs facing west, but last night I thought of switching the directions, so now I'm sleeping with my legs facing east. After about a minute later, I felt a scratching under my pillow. I didn't mind at first, but then it got annoyingly loud and it was constant. It felt like something was inside my pillow and scratching it, right below my head. But the sound felt like it was scratching wood. So naturally, I got up and checked it out, but there was nothing. Not a scratch under my bed. I thought I might just be making this up in my head or was something because it was late and I was exhausted. After a few minutes, when I was kind of like in half sleep, I began dreaming about my day. I don't know how or who, but someone tapped in my shoulder in my dream state and I moved my hand in a jerkingly manner. It was like those sudden jerks that happen in the night. It happened about two or three times and my body started itching. Then I switched the direction, again, legs to the west, and it was fine thereafter. I've experienced scratching many times, but last night it was just too much. I can't really think if it was a paranormal experience or not, but I have experienced strange dreams before. The dreams I had last night were strange enough because it had people that I never knew. Someone explain this. This happened in 2016, when I accompanied my paternal uncle to Goddess Vindyavasini Temple, located in Uttar Pradesh, one of the major 
Shakitpith, seat of the goddess in India. My aunt had been stuck in labor for quite a while, and someone suggested that she may have fallen victim to a tantric ritual called bandan binding that causes delay in childbirth. My uncle knew a priest in the temple who was considered to be adept in occult sciences and had reached out to him for help. We met the priest who was dressed in a modest saffron robe and had an air of humbleness around him. I could not even suspect anything that was about to happen in the next few hours. He confirmed that someone had done a Masani Kriya, graveyard ritual, on my aunt and if not reversed within time, it could end up in miscarriage or even death. We were horrified and couldn't believe what we were being told, but he assured that she could be saved provided we started the yagya, ceremonial fire, and other rituals on time. So, on the banks of the river Ganges, he lit a ceremonial fire and asked us to keep putting oblations into the fire when told. The ritual went on for quite a while, when the strangest thing I've ever experienced in my life happened. Suddenly, scores of subhuman creatures started coming from nowhere and began sitting around us in a circle. I cannot describe exactly how they looked, but all of them were stunted and had deformed legs or hands, with pus oozing out of their wounds. They looked very similar to humans, but there was something otherworldly about them that I can't put my finger upon. Now my uncle is a very serious and grumpy guy, you know the kind, and with the situation at hand, he wasn't in a good mood that day. I could see he thought that those creatures were beggars and was about to tell them to bugger off, but the priest, who seemed unfazed by the bizarre situation, put a finger on his lips and gestured him to remain quiet. As the ritual was about to end, the creatures disappeared as strangely as they had arrived. After the ritual ended, the priest asked for a bit of time to dispose the residue of the Yagya into the Ganges. Meanwhile, my uncle and toured the entire temple to find out where those creatures could have gone, but in vain. When the priest returned, I asked him about what we had just seen. He explained that the spirits that were being used to torment our aunt had arrived to distract us from our ritual. Like humans, they were also attached to the earth and do not want to cross over. Had anyone one of us reacted or got up from our place, the ritual would have failed and our aunt would be doomed. This is the reason he had gestured us to remain calm. Curiosity arose in my mind and I asked, have you ever seen God? No, but I have seen the devil, he said. I was bewildered to hear this because, apart from the obvious vision of the devil himself, Satan is predominantly a Christian spirit and the priest was an orthodox Hindu. Moreover, the concept of Satan, Lucifer, Shaitan does not exist in Hinduism. Before I became a priest, I was a vamachari, left-hand tantric, and had once got a chance to perform a ritual in an abandoned Christian graveyard. The specifics of the ritual are arcane, but you have to write a mantra on a piece of paper and make a wick out of it. The wick is then placed in an oil lamp and set alight. During midnight, 11 rounds of the mantra are to be recited in the graveyard while the wick is burning. Now, these demons do not like anyone trying to gain power over them and will do anything possible to distract from the ritual. Sometimes you'll see maidens wearing diaphanous garments strutting around the graveyard and hear their anklets tinkling. At other times, you'll hear the voices of your family screaming for help, babies crying and other hallucinations. If you sit steadfast, perform the ritual for 21 continuous days and not get distracted, the prince of demons, Satan himself, comes on the last day and begs for the oil left in the lamp. I'd describe Satan as being black, extremely hairy with horns, and walks with his hands and feet to the ground like an animal. He also makes a ho ho sound. This part is extremely treacherous, since it's a trap laid out by Satan to distract the practitioner. You have to give the oil to Satan, after which Satan will tempt you to ask for anything you want. If at this point you ask for anything, be it riches, women, or what have you, or refuse to give you the oil, you are doomed and will have to suffer from lunacy throughout the remainder of your miserable life. The only acceptable request is to ask Satan to leave you alone so you can complete your ritual in peace. Once the ritual is complete, you'll gain the ability to exercise any demon with ease. Suddenly, my uncle's mobile rang. It was the midwife calling to inform that his son had been delivered safely. I wish I could tell you that attacks on my aunt ceased after this event. They didn't. 
In the years that followed, my uncle would sometimes find pieces of dog bones tightly wrapped in red cloth, scattered around the precarious corners of the house. 